everybody you're watching dying out loud on the line and i'm glad to be with you tonight i had to miss last week i was ill and i sounded like a frog and nobody wanted to listen to that good to be back this week and i'm happy to be joined by my good friend dr daryl ray of recovering from religion hey daryl what's up in kansas city not much uh just hot as hell uh, but that's about normal for this time of year Good to be back. Good to be with you. Good to be with you, too. Yeah, we were scheduled to be on last week, and I appreciate you being able to join us again this week. I know you're a busy guy. You are the busiest retired man I've ever known. You know that, right? <laughs> I, as long as I'm having fun, I, I would say I work harder now than I did when I had a real job, but that's yeah, okay. That's like, I tell people I got ALS and retired and never been, never been busier. So Yeah, right. <laughs> You know, I think we're both in the same boat. I think so. It's you know, it's good to be busy. I don't know what else. What else would we be doing? How much fishing can you do? How much golf can you play? How much traveling can you? I don't know. You know, it's good to it's good to be engaged yep. with folks and feel like you're doing something that makes a difference, right? Yep. Right. Right. I'm love, and, I love the opportunity to travel. I just got back from Iceland. Did you you know that? I did see that. I was jealous, yeah. man. It's amazing. You were over there like two weeks or something. Yeah, right. It was it was a great trip. We went all over the island. A lot of hiking. Amazing country. Yeah. Yeah, we every day we hiked a minimum of five miles every day. Well, this is a call in show. We want to invite you to call in and say hi. Let us know what's on your mind. Let us know if you have questions or comments. We talk about everything from living and dying and faith and non faith and atheism and theism and anything that's on your mind. The call the number is at on the bottom of your screen. It's seven two oh Six one nine two two eight eight, or a web link in the description. It is September fifth, and also you can support us on Patreon. dot com slash call the line. And um, Daryl, I want to talk a lot about RFR and all the stuff you got going on. I do have a call. I want to jump on quick though, related to that, because I know she has paused her work day to call in to us and talk to us. So let's talk to Robin Sheher from Kentucky. Hey, Robin, you're on Great. the line with Hi, Daryl. Hey, Robin. Hey, how are y'all? Good. Doing well. Hey, Daryl. Thanks for calling in. We are anxious to talk yeah. to you. Okay. So, Robin, I know you're a, a, um, a, you're a viewer of the show and a supporter and we and I've talked several times, and then what I what I wanted to hear from you about and get an update from you is is your experience this past weekend at the county fair. From what I understand, you had a booth there to support recovering from religion, 
And then we also sent you some materials for I Am Dying Out Loud, our organization. So how, how many people did you deconvert? And no. <laughs> how did it go? Tell us how that went. Yeah, I'm dying of curiosity. Well, I want to hear all about it. Well, now in the in our manual, it says that we are not supposed to try to deconvert people. So I know, I, I know, that. I know. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> but um, it went good. I set up a, I, I, re, I borrowed a canopy from a friend of mine. Paid, got the booth and everything, and I brought some chairs and set out there, sort of in the front, so if somebody was tired, you know, because it was really hot that they could have a place to sit down and I had some free water one day and some candy. So that right that brought some people in. Just yeah. mostly sit around. I it, it went pretty good. It was um I had a set you know, several women that came up uh at first that I was explaining about your situation, Dave, and they were they offered prayers. They were gonna pray for you, <laughs> of course. But um <laughs> but there was well, there was point. more there was and there were some really nice Christians that came and you know and discussed how we needed to all live together you know peacefully and everything so that went good I didn't have anybody that really came up and told me that I was going to hell or anything. Um, well, that's we, I had one conversation with a conspiracy theorist for quite a while that was kind of interesting. He was to, he told me that science proved the Bible all the way through. <laughs> And um, I had a vet, some vet, a, a veteran that came by that was really in need of some help. Bad, mm. he was really struggling um, with a, just a lot of things that had happened in Iraq. Oh wow! Um, I yes, thought it went yeah. pretty good. I, I was, mm -hmm. I, I went, it went pretty good. It, it didn't make a big, you know, it wasn't a big chaos of me being there. That was one thing I was kind of worried about. So, yeah. Yeah, you never know, especially in a county fair when you can get about any anybody and their dog can walk by. How many dogs walked by? I'm guessing several. Yeah, yeah, it was no dog. I didn't see any dogs, but it was yeah, because I live oh, okay. in like a rural area in Kentucky where it's you know it's deeply um, religious. Yeah, yeah, deeply right. Well, that's an awesome thing you did, Robin. I think it's a yeah. great idea, um, and it's very brave of you because, you know, you could get some pretty nasty feedback from people, especially in a deeply conservative religious locale like you're in. So kudos to you for stepping out and, and doing that. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great way to promote uh, RFR on a local personal level. Yeah, I feel like it's grassroots. Sort of. <laughs> it is. I. It is grassroots. I think you may be the first person who's done a county fair. I think you really? are. Uh, we we've had we've had yeah, other please, people please. do things like pride, but I don't think anybody's done a county fair. See, we have another um, like a like a festival that co is coming up um, in like three weeks. And it's in a neighbor, just a, like it's in the same county, but it's in a neighboring town of where the fair is. And um, I'm, I think I'm going to sit up there too, and maybe do you know at least one night there. Good, good. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's you're you're pioneering something. Uh, well, uh, Steve will get your report, and I'm sure he's going to try to get other people to follow your your example. Well, actually, actually, we uh, on the ambassador channel, I noticed there's several ambassadors that was like, "Hey, how do I get Dave stuff on my? <laughs> <laughs> how, do I, how do I get Dave stuff too?" Because they were like, "How did you get Dave stuff?" Yeah, so, you just ask. That's all you got to do. Yeah. Just ask. <laughs> yeah, Dave, your yours came first. You you got yours in the mail, just like. And thank Bevan for that lovely letter she wrote. That was just awesome. Just really oh, nice. That's good. Yeah. Evan's listening in, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what prompted you to do this, Robin? I mean, what what uh, what was your impetus to say, let me just go promote RFR at a county fair? Well, I mean, um, I had signed up for the ambassador program in RFR, 
and really i'm there's no um you know I, there's no convention around i mean Banacon is probably the closest to me you know the yeah. free thought convention or whatever and of course it wasn't even running this year so right yeah um, we skipped here i just I just had to work with what I had. <laughs> well, you know? well, well, at NanoCon, you're preaching to the choir. Here, there is no choir what? to preach to. Yeah, that's great. That's what's beautiful, <laughs> yeah. in my view, Robin, is is it's one thing to have a booth at, a, at, the, at an atheist conference where, like Daryl says, we're all preaching to the choir. We're all in agreement. We're all from the same worldview and the mindset. When you go out into the world, so to speak, it's kind of the opposite of, of when we were Christians out evangelizing. And I think that's where the rubber meets the road. And that's where, and, and here's the thing, Robin, for every one person that stopped in to talk to you about what you were doing, there would be three or four that looked up, looked it over, were afraid to get too close. Cause you know how people are when <laughs> there's, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to come in and, and yeah. but if you, talk, you know, they'll see what it's about. And they'll make a mental note to check that out later because there are people struggling with their faith that we just don't know about and we never hear from until further down the road. But these wheels are turning and these doubts are forming and these questions are being asked in their minds. And it may take several experiences like that where they're confronted with something that helps them crystallize their thoughts or Maybe they even a small conversation with someone. We all know in our deconstruction process, it wasn't a one-time conversation. It wasn't an immediate thing that happened. It was a series of events, a series of thoughts and doubts and questions. So I just think it's awesome what you did, Robin. And, and like Daryl said, you know, it's easy to, to do it at these conferences where you know you're going to be warmly received. But to go out in the, in the belly of the beast, so to speak, in a conservative evangelical area and put yourself on the line like that. And basically you're putting up a flag saying, this is who I am and I'm here to help you find your way to freedom. And that's just awesome. So pat yourself on the back. If I, if I could reach you, I'd pat yourself on the back, I'd pat you on the back, but I can't. <laughs> but I, just, I just think what you did was awesome, Robin. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. I, 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 I had good conversations even with the some of the Christians that stopped, you know, that um, I, I just kind of, it, more than anything, you know, a lot of people around that area, you know, think of atheists as, um, you know, I don't know, they're scared of us. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I, have come out, I have come out publicly as an atheist, and so in, the, in that community pretty much. So the ones that know me, you know, very well. No, I am atheist. So right. I I feel like it, normalizing it a little more would help a lot is what I would yeah, say. Does. And those people have friends who are going through crises and when they find out, they'll have a number to call now. They You'll never know how many people you may have touched. You might have touched one people, yes. one person or 50 people. We don't know. And but thank you for, thank you for doing Dave's stuff too because I think RFR and, and dying out loud really dovetail nicely in many ways. I, I do appreciate too. that. I do too. That, that, yeah, I, I think they go together good. I mean, that, they just, you know, from one, the, your life and to the ending of your life, you know, that that's just a seamless type, type thing there. And all those people walking by are going to die someday, and they've all got a big fear of their own death, and they don't know what to do with that except to go to Jesus and wow, you just showed them an alternative. Yeah, yeah. I had a lot, I had several young people that stopped that took the information and stuff. Um, not sure they had much trauma, but they, I could tell they were the most group of the non-believers, the, the younger yeah. generations. Yep. Yeah, they're more open-minded as a rule generally speaking, than the older folks who are set in their ways and don't have as much to lose. As we know, so many people get to a point in their lives when even if they do start questioning their faith, there's so much of their life that is wrapped up in that family and friends and community that they just kind of count the cost and say, you know what, it'll just be a lot easier for me if I just stay quiet and stay in line and keep my head down. 
And it's tragic because then they're not living their true selves, and they're not living in what I would call freedom. But I know that a lot of people do that. I know I've heard from so many that just it took it took a colossal event for them to break free. And then there was trauma that followed that from loss of community, loss of family, loss of friends. And so that's why a lot of them do stay quiet. So kudos again to you for coming out as an atheist in a small rural conservative area and letting people see that you're normal. You're not weird. You're not angry. You're not um, mean. You're just a, a normal person who happens to not believe in their God. That's it, period. Yes. I mean, I'm sort of an oddity among, like, my company I work for, the trucking company I work for, our mechanic, you know, he's deeply religious. And yeah. we've had we've had, we've had had several conversations, actually, about it, really good conversations, because, but he was like, he at first he was like, you don't believe in God? You know what I mean? It was like he, he didn't even know anybody that didn't believe in God. <laughs> he was like... <laughs> <laughs> But, but he asked, he's real curious though about it. You know, he'll he'll ask me like sometimes when we're around where we can talk for a minute. He'll ask me questions. He was like, "Do y'all celebrate Christmas?" You know, <laughs> like that right there. And I was like, "I'm like, yeah, uh, yeah we celebrate Christmas." I said, um, so, celebrate. I said "My daughter would really be mad if we didn't." Do y'all sleep or do you stay up all night like vampires? What do y'all yeah. do? <laughs> so, yeah, suck blood. <laughs> No, I'm a normal person. I'm just like you. I I bleed, I cry, I laugh, but I just don't believe in God. Man, if we could just help people see that's all there is. That's the only difference. And yeah, it affects the way we see the world, the way we vote, the way we treat people. But it starts with just a simple non-belief in a God. That's what an atheist is. It's that simple. Tell him and you we, do believe in the... Tell him you do believe in the Wait. flying spaghetti monster and his holiness, the priest, a uh, high priest, which is me, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Daryl yeah, has okay. elected himself. I think Daryl has elected himself as the high priest of the flying spaghetti monster. Or I've not seen official credentials, but maybe you have. Uh, I have. I was elected by the high priest, uh, by the flying spaghetti monster himself. His newly appendage <laughs> reached down and touched me in Kansas, because only Kansas. You have to be from uh, Kansas to be a high priest, so that's okay. where it started. That's where he first revealed himself. So I was the logical, uh, logical high priest, and I'm the first one. And when I when I die, they're gonna have to find another one. But there's like only the one of me. Like there's the only pope. one. I, I'm yeah. higher than the fucking pope. Yep. Wow, that's that's saying a lot. <laughs> hey, well, at least the pope has come out against conservatism. Because evangelicals, I noticed, even well, they are too radical for him. Tell your ambassador, <laughs> tell your ambassador to friends to uh, get on the boat and and get get to their local fairs and festivals and spread the word. I think I think it's a I think it's a great venue. I think it's a great way to, like you said, a grassroots level, uh, person to person, conversation to conversation talk about this stuff and uh good for you robin you're like daryl said you're pioneer i felt like that the people you know by the numbers of non-believers that we know there is that in my area even though i don't know who they are there has to be non-believers those people yep. really those people really don't have any way of finding out about rfr or you know i mean they don't they don't mm. have they don't have they don't have they don't know nothing about none of that and they won't probably be at an atheist convention no they and know so but so i felt like that's probably where the need was you know the like you said the preaching <clears throat> to the choir at the free thought conventions mm -hmm. no good for you that's right and well done robin i know you got to get back to work so thanks for stopping and calling in we yeah, wanted to I'm, hear from you yeah uh, thank you robin thank you so much for volunteering for rfr Bye bye. Yes, and thank yes. you for helping bye. us with our with our stuff too. We'll be in touch, Robin. Thanks a bunch. All right. Bye bye. Bye. That's so good. I just uh, we all know the stories. We've all heard the stories. I've heard so many times. So and so didn't believe in God, but didn't know who to talk to. They were in the closet. They were hiding. 
their family didn't know, their friends didn't know, their coworkers didn't know. And then one day it slips or they finally break down and confess to someone. And the other person goes, oh, my God, me, too. I had no idea you didn't believe. I didn't know anyone else. And I've heard that. How yeah. many times you heard that, Daryl? Thousands, thousands. And, you know, just statistically, I don't care how re conservative or religious the area is. There's probably a minimum of 10% of the people who walk by her booth don't yeah. have a belief in some supernatural exactly. bullshit. Exactly. So that's pretty, that. She doesn't know who they are and they don't know who she is unless she goes there. So uh, that's what's so exciting about this. We've grown so much, Recovery Religion has grown so much and we've got so many new people that have jumped in to become ambassadors. Our outreach is like orders of magnitude bigger than it was even a year ago. It's it's really amazing to see. I mean, we, we, you are Baja Con. I, we, yeah. we, you know, we've got, People at American Atheists, American Humanists. We've got people going to <laughs> uh, Pride festivals uh, in June. There's several of those. There's, these are things I couldn't, Gail and I can't beat all those things. And having no. a, a good ambassador program has really made a big difference. Yeah, you've got this army of volunteers, the the chat room people, uh, the agents on the in the chat room, the ambassadors, which... Uh, when, when Steve calls, I want to hear more about that program and exactly what it is and what what people are doing. But man, you've because I'll ask you, you know, hey Daryl, what about this? And the, I don't know, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know what's going on. You, it's, it's, you can't keep up with your own with all that it's doing. You can't even keep up. It's so great though. It's bigger than one person, and that's what it should be. Yeah, it's it's much bigger. I think. Uh... Dave Klinge said the other day that we have 451. I think it's grown since then. Volunteers all around the world. We just added oh, a new volunteer. We just added a new volunteer from uh, uh, Kazakhstan. Literally, a oh, Russian-speaking wow. volunteer from Kazakhstan. And the person that trained him is one of our top, most involved volunteers, Russian-speaking from Moscow. Now, oh, isn't that crazy? That's amazing. Yeah, that's and then you go clear to the other end of the planet. We got volunteers all over from, you know, from India to uh, to Australia. Yeah. It's really cool. This stuff, we forget how what we're doing reaches the whole world because mm -hmm. of the internet. And we did a Zoom call with our Patreon supporters last month, and we had a person calling in on the on the call from Australia, or no way is it New Zealand, um, one, of the, one of the two, I get them mixed up. I know I know what they are, but I couldn't remember where he's from. And then another <laughs> person from Turkey was was calling in on the show. Oh, and this was, yeah. it was like eight o'clock at night our time, but they were in four in the morning and, 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 and eight o'clock the next day or the previous day or however the time works. Yeah, and they're a, just, a day ahead of us, yeah. I was just awestruck at, the reach that we have at our disposal with what we're doing and the things we're talking about and how people all over the world are just like us. They just go through the same stuff we do. They have the same needs and questions and doubts and trauma and, and things that we do. And it just, it's amazing that we can have that kind of influence and I'm just overwhelmed by it, you know? So you guys I know are in like, 25 countries or something like that oh at least that's that's just where we get our volunteers we got a lot more right maybe more countries from where um our callers come from we oh get yeah callers yeah. from every everywhere you name the country we probably had callers from them in the last month yeah that's pretty amazing yep. well we got callers stacking up here by the way folks as i mentioned earlier patreon.com slash call the line and also as you know, if you watch this show or any of the line shows, we love your super chats. That's one way you can support us and get your comment read on the air by Daryl and myself at the end of the show. Any super chat of $5 or more, whatever it is, euros, Canadian alleged dollars, Australian dollars, <laughs> pounds, whatever it is, uh, send that super chat in with your question or your comment or your love for Jimmy or Arden or any of anybody on the crew. And we'll read your comment on the line. So we appreciate your support. 
in that way. Um, let's go. And to... I will personally, I will personally read any any super chat that comes in that mentions the FSM, and I will use the voice of the, the FSM himself. That, that's so there. You go. Flying spaghetti. The flying monster. spaghetti. Monster. Yes. Yes. So. Okay, we're going to go to Brianna. Brianna, I'm sorry, Brianna. Um, she, her in Indiana. Hey, Brianna, you're on the Hi, line. Hi, yes. Cheryl, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Great, Brianna. I'm, I'm great. Thank you for calling. You and I have been in, in contact over the last week or two um, via email. But I thought with Daryl, now I mentioned to you, Brianna, that Daryl is our... Um, He's on our, he's an advisory member of our board of directors at I Am Dying Out Loud. And so when you sent your letter in about the issue that you had with your therapist, with that call to the therapist office, I, uh, I mentioned it to Daryl. We talked about it and he's given me some input, but I thought it'd be great if you called in tonight while Daryl was on the show and just tell us about your experience as much or as little as you want to share, if you would, Brianna. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I contacted you about possibly doing something about, I, I heard about your nonprofit first of all, and I found out what it was about and I had something, I had an incident that happened that I kept thinking about it and I finally contacted you and um, yeah. So last, I've, I've had mental health problems my whole life, but it's just a thing and I'm not really embarrassed about it. It's just there, but a lot of it has come from religious trauma i'm i'm realizing um more recently mm -hmm. and i've had a lot of i've had quite a bit of bad experiences with therapists with that topic um but last year oh, I, I i was having a horrible day and i've i've also had um uh, issues with like suicidal thoughts and all of that and I was having that kind of a day and I was not okay and um, I was actually at the time on on a waiting list for for the uh, secular therapy project for a therapist there who thankfully I was able to get in with very soon after this and she's been my therapist oh. ever since and I adore her but <laughs> um, oh I'm glad to hear that that makes my day thank you that's good to hear Back up just a touch from the mic. It's popping a little bit. If you could back up, I think we can hear you better before you go on, if you don't mind. Sure. Is that a little better? That's better. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, but while I was on this waiting list, um, I had this horrible day. I, I honestly don't even remember what I was particularly triggered about this day. But I knew that my, my past therapist did not, was not helpful with religious trauma. I just felt very, um, uh, she, she, did, she just didn't get it. She felt very uncomfortable any time, any way I tried to bring up the topic. It just, I wasn't going to get any help there. Um, so I, I was just calling around to see if I could get in anywhere before I could get like a real secular therapist because no offense to therapists in my area, but I don't really trust that they're going to be helpful on this. But I thought yeah, maybe right. getting in somewhere is better than nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. So I called a place I drive by all the time just to see, and the receptionist answered, and, and then she goes, hey, like, I can't get you in today, but but we can start a file. We need to try again on Monday kind of thing. And so we did that. We started a file. She just started asking questions and but of course she wants to know why i need to see a therapist and i uh against my better judgment i explain religious trauma to her as best as i can in my already kind of upset state um and she says maybe maybe i should just go talk to a pastor you know <laughs> mm. um, and i was wow. uh, that sent me a yeah. little bit over the edge <laughs> as it should mm. It, it, well, I it, just it was, pisses, it was terrible. That that pisses me off. Any good, any well trained therapist would never do that, and any well trained therapist would never have a receptionist or whoever intake person who did that either. That's just almost unforgivable. Yeah, go ahead. I'm you, sorry. How did you respond to the receptionist then, Brianna? 
Well, I actually try. Like, I mean, I was I was very upset, obviously. Um, but I, 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 I was honest with her and I said, like, that's not, that's not okay. <laughs> like, a pastor isn't a therapist. And like, I'm sure I was very garbled and upset, but you know, I, I still stood up for myself a little bit and was like, Hey, like, this isn't fine. This isn't okay. And the more I pushed back, you know, she got mad and said I had anger problems and, <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. uh, let's see what else. Oh, oh, she asked me, well, where I'm going when, when I die, you know, where am I going? <laughs> I don't oh, wow. It was wild. <laughs> yeah, that is just so inappropriate. And she's triggering the very thing you called about. That's exactly. And you've yeah. got somebody with suicidal ideation, and you're talking to them about where they're going to go when they die. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> so Yeah, it was pretty unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah, so you've uh, you've written a letter, and it's a really really well written letter, by the way, Brianna. And um, you and I are kind of editing on that. And so I ran it by Daryl. I haven't sent you the letter, have I, Daryl? But we talked about this this situation. I haven't didn't? seen the letter, but I no, so not since we talked. Um, but yeah, I'm very I'm very interested in. Is, and is this a letter letter to the um, licensing board? Well, that's what you recommended, and so it's the letter to the therapy office uh, that she called, and then you recommended copying the uh, licensing board in the state. Um, right. And that's right. what we're planning to do. Uh, so I'm researching okay. what, who covers that in that state. Right. Good. Well, yeah, you want to, you wanna, of course, let the therapist know what happened so that the therapist can you know, make a decision what, what if anything they want to do, but you, yeah. you don't want to, you don't want to let it be that there alone. You want to, uh, you want to uh, alert, alert the licensing board, Brianna, and it, it's, it's not inappropriate. Don't, yeah, that's what licensing boards are there for. They have a standard of ethics that they are in charge of enforcing throughout the state uh, on, on therapists, and they can't enforce the ethics if nobody ever tells them. So right. you'll be telling them, and uh, the therapist will find out too. Therapists will probably get a call from the ethics board. They'll they'll explain what happened. You know, they'll be defensive probably and not tell the truth. Who knows? But ultimately, <laughs> that puts that puts that therapist on their radar. So the next time something comes up, it won't be the first time. And, right. and what you're really doing is complaining about the therapist, um, the receptionist. They should not. They should have no say in in anything about. They're not a therapist. They she should not be giving you that advice. Period. So, she, um, you know, there's disciplinary stuff that the therapist needs to do about the receptionist. Yeah, and yeah, they should know better than to have. You know, it's, it's not enough to say, well, that the receptionist should have done that. You know, no. she knows. They they should Recep train the receptionist never to to speak like that to a, to a client. A receptionist is not, should never be a part of the problem. <laughs> that's just crazy. Why are you calling us? Oh, you don't want so more bad. of a problem when you hang up. Brianna, I am, I'm, I'm glad you told us about, you told Dave about it. And I'm, uh, let me, let me throw something out here. It's kind of off, a little off topic, but it's right on topic, I guess, with respect to what you're bringing up, Brianna. There are many, many bad, poorly trained therapists out there. And there are many, many therapists out there who have not, will not let go of their own religious ideology or can't let go of it. And that, that's the mark of a poorly trained therapist when their own ideology gets in the way of the therapy. So you have experienced that firsthand, un unfortunately. Uh, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so what we are doing at, at the Secular Therapy Project, Dr. Travis McKee-Borst, is the director of the whole project. Um, I started it back in 2012, but he's he's been the director for the last four or five years. We're we're trying to educate licensing boards about the ethics of religious of dealing with religious trauma and how how many therapists are out there that are pushing their religion on their own clients. So that's one of our things, and we need information. We need people like you to tell us when these things happen so that we can document them and ultimately turn it into an educational program 
that can help these licensing boards put this into their standards about how do you treat people who come to you with religious trauma or, or religiously induced uh, problems. So thank yeah. you. Thank you for bringing this up. And when you yes. get all this finished, we'd like to have a copy of the letter and we will put it in our files because we're going to build a whole you know, whole argument around this or whole file system around it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I, if I can be any part of a solution, I am happy to because Good. it is wild. And I, I've, I've been through it with therapists, let me tell you. <laughs> but well, that's you, why you got hooked up with a secular... Uh, therapist from the Secular Therapy Project, right? Yes, yeah, and that happened thankfully, like probably about two weeks after this horrible incident. Um, so that was really good. good. Yeah, if good. if you don't mind, and I, you don't need to uh, give us any details or any confidential, uh, you know, uh, main, maintain your confidentiality, of course. But I'd be curious how how do you feel, and how is this how is this therapist helping you? How are they different from perhaps other therapists that you work with on this particular subject? Well, I don't feel, I don't feel like, I, like I don't think anybody should ever feel like they have to super filter themselves in front of their therapist. And I don't think I'd ever experienced that before, where I didn't have to filter myself and filter my thoughts about religion. And I don't have to filter around my my current therapist. And that part is very yeah. nice. And. And she also, but she also understands like the balance because I have a specific view on this. I'm like, look, I need, and I told her like the first time I met because about like my issues I've had with therapists and I was like, look, I'm not looking to stay angry at religion forever and ever and ever. That's not my goal. But right. every other therapist I've had until now won't even address this topic with me. Like they just yeah act like I'm the closed minded one for not accepting religion and that's kind of it. <laughs> um yeah, right. so it's nice that she can handle the balance. Like if I need to rant, I can rant. If I need to, if I'm like getting to a place where I am healing a little bit and I want to work on that side of it, I can do that too. Good. Good. Do you do you think, Brianna, just knowing when you sit down with a a sec a, a therapist from the secular therapy project and you know they've been they've been carefully screened and vetted. Does it help you going in and having religious trauma, knowing that that process has happened, and that you can be more at peace and feel safer in that environment? Would you say that's true? Oh, definitely. I mean, I was still nervous going in just because of my prior experiences, but yeah, I was really impressed. Like. Like, I just think my therapist is very talented as a therapist in general, even religious trauma aside. Like, it doesn't matter what mood I'm in, she can adapt. And I, and I like that, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm so happy about that. Yeah. Well, that's well, the mark of a good, a good therapist. Yeah. Even if a therapist has no special training in, in religious trauma, they should still be able to help you because trauma is something that's universal. We understand it. And you just, there's different angles. There's war trauma. Of course, there's different flavors of it. They should not have to go. I mean, they've got people coming to their office all the time with trauma, whether it's yeah. religious or not. So I think the problem with religious people, with Trump, with therapists who, like you said, Daryl, do not remove their religious <laughs> ideology from their practices. It's, it's in their background of their thinking. <clears throat> so they can't even hold space or re religious trauma being a thing, even if they're not trained in it, they discredit it. And that's what you experienced, right, Brianna? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I was never like, I never had a therapist try to convert me. Like, I couldn't even tell you if they were actually like a specific religion or whatever, but it was just that very clear discomfort. Like, they put a wall up when that topic yeah, comes right. up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you know, that's... That so many things here that I want to say to you, Brianna. First of all, just kudos to you for the strength to keep pressing on and not letting that experience uh, sideline you and, 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 and defeat you. You, you. you kept pushing until you got the help you needed. And that's, that takes a lot of strength. And I hope you realize that about yourself, that you really have 
a strength in you that would not let you take no for an answer, would not let you be put off of what you knew you needed. So good for you in that regard. Thank you. And, and also thank you for reaching out about this and speaking up about it. Like Daryl said, we need to know about these things because this needs to be reported. And the more we speak up about it, the more people will gain knowledge. It will be a teaching experience. So you, you're helping in that regard too. Yeah. And you know, I, this is crazy, but the people on the ethics board or on the licensing board, whichever board it ends up in, a lot of them still have religious ideas that get in the way. So we're yeah. educating the people yeah. who are supervising this and we need to educate them. Well, their first, the th first thing they learn is first do no harm. And what we've got to help them see is that these religious ideations that are pushed upon people like you, Brianna, are doing harm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm uh, super proud yeah. of you for all of these things I mentioned before, and we're just so glad to be working with you on this. And um, so we'll, we'll, I'm anxious to see where this goes. <laughs> Great. Thank yeah. you, Brianna. It'll be interesting. <laughs> it, it will. Well, keep being, keep being awesome, you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. You guys, too. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Right. We're calling you tonight. I'll be in touch. All right. All righty. Bye-bye. Sounds good. Bye bye. Is she awesome? I love it, and I I love her. I I'm thrilled that she has brought this up because it's not just not just what she's doing, but people listening right now are now being educated about issues that Absolutely. almost never get talked about. I and know. she's not the first person. She's not the only person listening right now that hadn't had trouble with a therapist. I'll guarantee you that. I know, and that's the thing. If you're listening and this resonates with you, let us know. Reach out to me, reach out to Daryl, RFR, I'm dyingoutloud.org. We've got those, that link should be in the notes somewhere or in the chat. I'm dyingoutloud.org. That's how Brianna found us. Um, we're connected with Daryl at RFR, preppingformreligion.org. That'll also be linked. This also makes me think of something else the fact that she was on a waiting list for Secular Therapy Project. And you know, I've talked about this before, Daryl, you need more secular therapists. And yeah, your we do. Process, your vetting process, as you told me, is brutal. Explain yeah. that. <laughs> talk about that for just a minute, because we got a calls lined up, but I want to talk about the sure. secular therapy. Well, we've been working at this since 20, May of 2012 when we started, and we now have 772 vetted therapists. But of all the therapists that apply to us, we turn down about 30 to 40% because they don't meet our criteria. They will, number one, have to be licensed. Number two, they have to be um, secular. And number three, they have to, and they have to prove to us they're secular. They can't just say, yeah, well, I'm secular. I can, they can't tell us, yeah, I'll keep my religion out of it. That won't work. Mm -hmm. that, that does not fly. And third, they have to uh, prove to us, again, that they use evidence-based methodologies. Right. They can't right. be doing new age woo-woo bullshit or Jungian stuff or Adlerian stuff or Freudian stuff. That doesn't fly. None of that is evidence based. So if they can prove to us those three things, <laughs> wherever the camera is here, <laughs> then uh, <laughs> we let them in and show and, their FSM membership card. Right, Flying Spaghetti Monster membership. They have to be a member. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we haven't got there yet, but maybe we will someday. I don't know. <laughs> but, but if you're watching this and you have a therapist you think might qualify, how how would a therapist, you can go to the RFR website and, and apply that way, Daryl? Yes, two things. Let me say, if you know a therapist and they're really good, you think they're secular, tell them to go apply to Secular Therapy Project. Seculartherapy.org is where it's at. But you may get on Secular Therapy and look for a therapist yourself, and you may not find one that's close to you or one that fits your needs. And you can still look for therapists you know, on the, in the bigger world but what we ask you to do is go to seculartherapy.org and hit the button, apply as a therapist. Even if you're just a client, go hit the button, apply as a therapist. And that'll bring up the page with the requirements that we ask of all of our therapists. Then if you go on, you know, find a, a therapist through psychology today or something, and you're not sure if they'll fit your needs or if they're secular, you print that page off and 
show it to them and said, can you abide by these rules? And if they say yes, then you're probably okay. If they say no, or or if they hesitate, then you probably better find a different therapist. Yeah, You can do some of your own vetting, but we try to do all the vetting for you. We're in nine different countries now, but we, we have a lot of people calling in that are from countries we don't have a therapist in. And the yeah. other, other thing is you can find a therapist that'll do distance counseling by Zoom, just kind of like what we're doing right now. Yeah. That that works as well. And that's, I mean, obviously the need is is growing and you can see by Brianna's experience that there's just not enough, um, not enough out there. So uh, let, uh, help, and, help us grow since, that. During COVID and since then, our therapists have been overwhelmed. That yeah. Almost all of our therapists may, not all, but many have waiting lists. So. Yeah. And, and another problem is a lot of therapists can't do therapy outside of their own uh, jurisdiction, their state or province. Mm-hmm. So that's another problem. You may have a you have a therapist yeah. just a few yeah. miles away, but they're on the other side. That's a problem. We we don't we can't do much about that. That's a licensing issue. Yep. Well, let's get to some calls there back. If you're on the line, hang on. We're going to get to you. Uh, be patient, please. Jason, he, him in Tennessee. Hey, Jason, you're on the line with Dave and Daryl. Yeah. Hey, hey, Dave Fine. and Daryl, how are you both doing tonight? Good, good, good. Thanks for calling. Yeah, yes, sirs. Uh, if you're okay with being called that, uh, sure. just calling in um, casually to ask a question. I'm not here to pick a fight tonight. Um, sure. Dave, you and I talked. I don't know. It's probably been over a year ago. You had thousands of callers. May not remember me. I talked with you and Matt Dillahunty. Um, and we were talking about various subjects. Sorry, my dog's barking. Dave, I basically want to get to the point. I, a, I, I asked Matt to see to check in on how you're doing. I talked to Matt and Jimmy lately on the line. They mm-hmm. told me about you still had a show. I know it sounds like a dumb question, but regardless, you know, how are you doing? I sincerely mean that. And B, I wanted to kind of, I knew you were a Christian minister at one point. I just wanted to hear as a Christian, your thoughts or your deconversion process, if you want to, if you don't mind summing it up. Sure. Um, get the book, Childish Things on Amazon. Yeah. No, just oh, no, no. You let me do that. <laughs> I, Jason, go buy Dave's book. You'll find the story compelling, compelling. I guarantee it. It's a great book. Oh, I endorse I, about one out of every. It. I endorse about one out of every 20 books that comes to me, and I endorse Dave. Very enthusiastically, him and Drew Beckius, yes, they're about the only people I want, I've endorsed. So, yeah, um, get the book and read it. That is the title that, is called What Again? It's called Childish Things, a memoir. Childish. It's on Amazon. Um, I, I, wrote, I wrote that you may know of the scripture in First Corinthians that says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, and I uh, understood like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's mm-hmm. the, yes, sir. That's the scripture I'm referring to with the title of the book. And in that sense, what I'm saying is I came to believe that a belief in a in a, a supernatural deity was a childish belief. Now, I don't mean that to discredit your beliefs or to insult you or to call you a child. But I do say that evangelical Christianity by definition, or if you look at at certain scriptures that that define the faith system there, it does want to keep you in a child childish mentality, non non maturing. We want to keep you as a child. Look at the language. You're a child of God. Um, he's your father. Those are terms meant to keep you in a subservient um, less than role. I'm, I'm not finding the right word. And so that's why I use that phrase to say I put away those childish things and started thinking like a reasonable adult because I believe that a belief in a supernatural deity who's involved in our lives, but we see no evidence of that other than a belief in what the scripture says is a childish belief. It's not reasoning with the world in a mature way. So I say all that to say that that's the reason behind my deconstruction or the impetus behind it. The, the uh, an epiphany moment. I can't say that there was one moment. There was a series of moments, a series of questions 
really over my lifetime, if you do get the book and read it, you'll see as I journey through my life of getting into the faith and walking in faith and then getting out of it is a, is a lifetime of questions and doubts that I keep suppressing and avoiding and ignoring until finally the overflow of it is just too much and it cascades. And I finally give myself permission to ask the hard questions without the assumption that I already know the answer. And that's the difference between Christians having doubts and saying, well, yeah, I have doubts too, but in the back of your mind, you know the answer that God's real and you still believe in him. But when you put it on the table and say, you know what, I may not, I may not come out of this with my faith, but I'm going to ask the hard questions and I'm going to see where this leads me. And I'm going to be open to the evidence and open to the, to whatever, wherever this takes me. That's what eventually happened. And it's not a one-time thing. Almost anyone I've ever talked to who's deconstructed or deconverted, it, it, it's the similar kind of story. There are a series of events, a series of, of questions without answers. Of you know, I, the one thing, one way I've put it in many interviews is that I got tired of making excuses for God's poor behavior. Because over and over again, this God that I believed in, who was supposed to be present and active in my life, was not showing up. Over and over again, I was doing all the work as a minister, as a Christian, as a believer. I was doing the Bible study. I was doing the prayer. I was doing the fasting. Where was God? Nowhere. Nowhere. I, I believed he was speaking to me in my head, but unanswered prayers, um, non-involvement, invisible, um, not there. And I finally was allowed, I finally allowed myself to admit that that was the truth. And once I saw that, I was done. And the can, other question. Can I ask you a few more follow-ups? And I'll read your book. I'll buy it. I promise. I, I, I'm not just trying to get you to hash out your, your book over the air. Well, I'm, not, um, I'm not trying to sell a book either, but it's, it's the best no. way to end. And that's what I tell people. If you really want to, I've had people ask me, help me understand your deconversion. I'll say, if you really want to understand it, read the, read the book that I wrote that took me over two years to write that completely details it in, in honest, in honest detail, right? Daryl, I mean, I was honest about yep. everything, my own shortcomings. Yep. So it's not just a bash God book. It's my own honest journey into and out of the faith. But what are your follow up questions real quick? OK, and, and, and but also, Dave, not that my opinion matters necessarily to you, but I find you to be sincere. And even if we disagreed on things, I never took it like you were just trying to play an angle or game. So, yes, I'd be happy to read your book. Um, my follow up questions are for me personally, I did not actually grow up as a Christian. I was not uh, indoctrinated into the belief it took me probably about seven to 10 years to struggle with, do I believe this or not and why? My question is, when you came to be a Christian, was it a rapid conversion or did it take you a long time to come into the faith? Radical conversion in, I think, chapter three, or maybe chapter four. Yeah, I was caught up in the Jesus movement. I was a Jesus freak in the 70s. Um, I'm a lot older than you. You may not remember that, but it was a real thing. Jesus was on the cover of Time magazine. Jesus Christ Superstar was a big hit. The Doobie Brothers were smoking dope and singing about Jesus being all right with them. Um, so it was a it was a pretty wild time, and the hippies were were finding Jesus and getting baptized in the Pacific Ocean. And I got caught up in that and got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. And I was off to the races at the age of 18. So no, I didn't grow up as a Christian either. I was not raised in it. I was not indoctrinated. I came into it uh, under the influence of, heavily by my Christian brother who got saved a year before me. And I just got, I got caught up in uh, the excitement of, of uh, radical Christianity at the age of 18. Okay. Um, as a, just a couple more questions, I promise. Okay. Is, as a minister, when you started to maybe what you would describe as lose the faith, you know, did you struggle with ministering to others, feeling like maybe your doubts made you feel hypocritical at the time? 
No, I was genuinely a believer. I genuinely believed there were my answers to people who a wife who lost her husband to cancer or, you know, and prayed and prayed and prayed. Um, uh, my answers were that the typical answer that we give is that there are some things we don't understand and God has plans that we're not aware of and those kind of things. But I still believed genuinely that God answered prayer and that God was involved in our lives. So I didn't have a sense that I was um, not being honest with them. I was honest with my doubts, but maintained a bedrock belief that God was bigger than us and knew more than us. And then that's what I would share with the Christians in my church that would come to me for answers. Okay. And my last question on the topic, Dave, and then I did want to ask you, how are you doing? And I mean that, but uh, the last question is, you know, Matt said, on his show one day, he said something like, and I like that he was being very um, transparent and honest. And it just, you know, part of being human, I guess, the human mind or experience. He said that, you know, even though that he doesn't have any, you know, real doubt, I guess you could say, he was sitting on his couch one day contemplating, what if he is wrong? Could there remotely possibly be a God? Do you ever have that thought flash across your mind occasionally? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm always open to the idea that I could be wrong. I think that's central to free thinking. We don't, the thing I hate is certainty of any kind. I don't like the certainty that there is a God, and I don't like people being certain that there's not one. I just don't see evidence of it. Um, I'm comfortable with the life I live. I'm comfortable with the person I am. If I find out at some point that I was wrong and that there is a God, um, if he's the God of the Bible, I still wouldn't worship him. If you were to prove to me tonight that the God of the Bible is real and he's, he's everything the Bible describes him to be, I would tell you, well, okay, you've proved to me that this thing exists. I still won't give him my my uh, worship because he's a, he's a moral monster. And I, I stand by that. Um, the God of the Bible is a moral monster. And so I would not yeah, worship or that I would not worship that God, even if I was proven, if it was proven that he was real, but I, I don't sit around thinking that I may be wrong. I'm not worried about being wrong. I'm not worried about going to hell. I don't think that hell makes sense on any rational level. Um, philosophically, scientifically, I just don't see where it makes sense at all. Um, and if, but if it did exist and I was in danger of it, I would still live the life I'm living because it's an honest life and, and I wouldn't change anything about it. Yeah. And you and I talked about the whole, even if God was demonstrated to be real, if that was possible, if we could somehow demonstrate it, you did say, yeah, you wouldn't worship such a God. And I can understand or see if you come from it, from a human secular, secularist or what do they call it? Human centrist, basically philosophy. If your if, if your viewpoint is that from somebody that's, you know, what's the word? Secular humanist. Sorry. Took me a moment yeah. to get there. I'm a little under the weather at the moment. If you're a secular humanist, I could see that vantage or viewpoint. Mm -hmm. But anyway, regardless, thank you for answering all those questions. I'll read your book. Um, I again just wanted to see. You know, you know. I know you've talked about it on the show lately. You know what? I guess. Yeah, I mean, just how how are you holding up? I, I know you do talk about it, but I just well, I appreciate you. I appreciate you asking. I'm if you if folks see me fidgeting in the chair, it's because I have our time being comfortable. My neck is getting weaker, so I have to rest it back, and so it's hard for me to sit and and not have to deal with repositioning. So there there are challenges that are increasing with with the progression of the disease, but as you can see, I'm still talking fine, and that's you know when it progresses to the mouth area, the breathing and the talking and the eating, that's when it gets really tricky. So my um, symptoms are still relegated pretty much to my torso, my, my uh, arms and legs, 
require more assistance and I'm not able to do a lot of the things that, that I could do with walking and handling things. So that's pretty much where it's at. I'm a slow progressor. Um, there are many who are progressing faster than me. I know that I talked to them. In fact, I, if you guys were watch anyone who was watching the show a couple of weeks ago, we had, uh, James Mason call in from Idaho, who is a young man, um, former Mormon, uh, he was diagnosed with ALS a year and a half ago, and we had a really poignant um, conversation. In fact, I talked with him this afternoon just to check in on him, and he's doing good. His attitude is great, but he's losing, man. He's losing this battle. He's in a wheelchair. He's progressing much faster than I than I have, and uh, he's younger than yeah. me, and it's the heart because he's he's he had his whole life ahead of him. I'm an old fart. Um, and I've lived most of my life. I'm not as old as Daryl, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty old. I'm not far behind you, Daryl, but I've lived <laughs> most of my life and I'm I'm OK. Not OK with dying. Obviously, I want to live as long as I can. But the younger ones who get it and progress faster, that's what really breaks my heart. And so thank you for asking, though, Jason. I really appreciate your call and the tone of it. I really appreciate it. Yes, Dave. And just to let you know, you've been on my heart since we spoke last time. You did kind of just briefly talk about your struggles. So, hey, I I don't know what to say. I'm not going to say anything disingenuous. Okay. So, all right. Thank you for your time. Thanks. And, uh, I'll hang up. Thanks, Thanks for calling. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. That's a good call. That's a good guy. I, uh, I don't remember the conversation specifically, but he's uh, he's uh, asking some questions, I think. That's good. Right. Right. You know, uh, my Mormon friends, uh, your your example and my Mormon friends call that the collapsing bookshelf. Yeah, they said that as you go through life as a Christian, you have these doubts. You so I'll just put those on the bookshelf, and uh, then one day there's so much on the bookshelf it all comes crashing down, and that's when they leave the Mormon church or what? they realize it's all. And I see that uh, it's not just Mormons, but that's where I heard it first was the yeah collapsing bookshelf. Thing. It's a good way to put it. Yeah, I'll deal with that doubt later. I'll deal with that yeah. question. Later. Right. Hang in there, My folks. I see you in the, in the queue. The calls are stacking up. We'll get to as many as we can, hopefully all of them. Uh, let's talk to Wallace. In, uh, Eham in Georgia. Hello, Wallace. You're on the line with Dave and Daryl. Hey, this is Wallace. Um, so I was just calling about the fact that um, uh, a week ago today, uh, my mom passed and she was growing up. She was an amazing, open, accepting, just bright, per vibrant person. And, um, a lot in the last like a uh, decade or so, she got caught up in the, she got caught up in and all the the internet conspiracy stuff yeah. and it basically it it changed her and the person that i lost is not the person that i grew up with and it was i mean towards the end it got so bad that um we had to go low contact and specifically to protect my son from the stuff that she was listening to. And I mean, hell, she, I'm, I'm, I'm a lifetime atheist. My dad's a, a professor of anthropology. She raised us Unitarian Universalists for God's sake. And, mm -hmm. um, and towards the end of there, she was like anti LGBT talking about the gay agenda, the trans agenda, she would go and buy pickles that were specifically not kosher because she didn't want to buy anything that was kosher and everything was they, them. And she had a heart condition and she refused to get it treated and it caused a, a couple of strokes and um, she refused to get that treated and it ended up killing her. And it was like, I mean, it's like my, 
Yeah, it's like these these charlatans and scam artists stole my mother from me. And I just want to put this out there, that those fucking scammers and those charlatans and those spiritual healer, mumbo-jumbo, alternative medicine people, and all of those people, they, they do real harm. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Wallace, first of all, I'm sorry for your loss. I mean, yeah. it sounds to me like you lost your mother twice. And right. yeah, that's heartbreaking. And I'm really, really sorry about that. That is so hard you to know, hear, Wallace. I'm sorry to hear that. Really hard. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not it's like we literally would have arguments in the last few years. And she, like, she, she, like the last thing I did for her as a hopefully to, as a placebo to make her life better is I built, I, I, I made her bedroom into a Faraday cage to collect, to protect her from electromagnetic fields that she was ter so terrified of that she'd sequestered herself in a basement under a magic blanket that would shield her from it. Wow. I mean, literally, I I saw somebody go from a bright, shining, open, caring person to somebody who was cowering in fear in the basement. That's tragic. I'm really sorry. Well, That's Wallace, oh, how Wallace do you do let me th let me throw something out here because, and I I don't do. Um, I'm not doing a remote diagnosis or anything, but what you've described is someone who probably had a mental illness and it may have been minor. It may have been hidden. It may not have been super disabling, but with, with the environmental influence around her, the internet, the conspiracy therapist, the, you know, new news or whatever she was looking at and listening to uh, triggers mm -hmm. things that make the mental illness get worse and worse and worse. Yeah. And so she becomes, um, she literally gets infected. Her a, a mental illness oftentimes is like a portal for crazy ideas to come into our head. Yeah. And it, yeah. and it can happen to a wide range of people, not just people who are not have a mental illness problem. But when it gets as bad as it did, uh, your mother probably suffered from a serious mental illness. And I won't say what it is. I've got my own hints, but I I'm not can't diagnose somebody that I haven't talked to or, or personally examined. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I'm you, definitely sure. It, it would mean, have taken it would have taken a very well trained uh, psychotherapist to probably help her. And I'm. She yeah, and then, and especially there towards the end, the only way to do that would have been to take away what little autonomy she had r remaining, thus destroying her. Thus, I was stuck in a loop where the only yeah. thing I could do was try to make things as good as I could. Right. Well, she sounds like she was lucky to have a son like you. Yeah, I was going to say, I yeah. think that was a call on your part, Wallace, because even though you knew that was crazy to build those walls for her and protect her from the electromagnetic shit, you knew that was bonkers, but you did it for her out of your love for mm -hmm. her. That was a sacrifice on your part. And I think that's, that's a good, that's a good sign. That's a good thing you did. You should take, you should take yeah. pride in that and solace in that. And knowing that, as Daryl said, she probably, suffered from mental illness it wasn't a personal attack on you or it was just her not knowing how to navigate the confusion in her mind and that's how it came yeah. out you want to know what the worst part is i finished exactly. the project less than a month ago and they hadn't finished getting things put back together to move her in mm. so she never even got to experience it i'm sorry mm -hmm. Well, I can see you're suffering from grief at her loss and, and the loss yeah, of her mind. I know. 
for the last several and, nine yeah. years ago. And I, that's just, I hope you, yeah. I hope you are accessing some good therapy to process your own grief and loss. Well, I'm, I'm not in therapy right now. I don't really have access to it yet. Um, between insurance situations and you know how that goes. So, um, but I'm good at handling and processing, you know, the one thing that does frustrate me is the, you know, honestly, like people saying they want to take your grief. That's kind of like, it's like when somebody says that it's like, they're saying, I want to take, that experience from you and you know it's like that yeah. hurts you know just let me grieve yeah you know right. what i'm saying jason i whether you can afford therapy or not uh you could you could find a group to join yeah. that helps people process um their grief and uh, although I will be, yeah. I will say that there are a lot of groups out there are religiously based, of course. But yeah, we have, and I don't do that. <laughs> we, we have at Recover for Religion, we have an online uh, community that you have to come through us. It's not, you can't find it on the internet, but you could go mm -hmm. to our chat line and you could ask, I would like to join the online community. And then you get behind, yeah. it's all free, but it's just, well vetted and nobody can get into it and you could there talk to other people who've lost loved ones and are grieving and you know you could yeah. and they're all they're almost all secular if not atheist so yeah you'd have a, yeah. you'd have a group to talk to there yeah. or you could join you could join our online uh virtual groups we've got virtual groups almost every day of the week that you can join yeah. by zoom and some of them by and you know they're all willing to listen and talk and yeah. share experiences so Anyway, that'd be yeah. one suggestion. Uh, Daryl, what do you know about Grief Beyond Belief? There's an organization that do you, I don't know yeah, that much. About it. I yeah, good... uh, Rebecca Hensley de developed yeah. that group years ago, back in like 2010 or 2012. And you could join Grief Beyond Belief. Uh, it's a Facebook, it's yeah. an open Facebook page. Are you familiar with it, Jason? I mean, Wallace? Yeah. No, I haven't. I'm I'm familiar with Facebook, so okay. But well, I'm on, not familiar on, with that organization. Yeah, go on Facebook and look up Grief Beyond Belief and ask if if you can join. They will ask you a few questions because they're going to vet. They don't want just you know random jerks yeah. coming in there, of course. Right. But that would be a perfect perfect group for you. There are hundreds of other people. Yeah. And there's dozens, I guarantee you, there are dozens who went through similar experiences to you did. And yeah. Oh, yeah. It's called Grief Beyond yeah. Belief. And it's yeah. by a, a friend of mine, Rebecca Hensley, out of the San Francisco Bay Area. She started it years ago when she lost a child. And uh, she's done a yeah. great, great job there. I would say, look at joining that group. Yeah. If you have yeah, trouble, check it out. Yeah. Just reach out to me, Wallace, if you need help connecting with any groups. And yeah, just be in touch. We're we're here to talk, and um, you'll get yeah. through this. Really, really sorry you experienced this. Um, yeah, it's tough. There's no easy way to put it. Yeah, it's just yeah. It, I mean, I know it is what it is. I mean, she lived a pretty long life, but it's still it's too soon, and it's you know it's one of those things where it's like each step of the way, it's like. Um, the 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 move towards where i am today it directly like it tracks medical choices that she made all yeah. along the way all yeah. because of being convinced deeper and deeper into this this world and it's a really dark world and it's like it's almost like i went from like you know it's it's almost like I mean, I guess she was always kind of into woo and all that other stuff, but it's like, you know, the the dive into the, like, the toxic shit, the really toxic shit was, it was stark and yeah. it, it, you know, and it was just, it was one of those things and it's like, you know, um, 
she would listen to like stuff talking about the gay agenda while my and anti trans stuff and things like that where my gay sister is sleeping having to like hear that shit with yeah. her fucking wife and <laughs> it's just it it's it's poison mm. and it's like i can't um I, I can't imagine like what they were going through and i mean it's just it's so hard to be so committed to somebody who because of this decline just like denied who you are right. and yeah i mean it's just i just can't even imagine it's like how do you hold these thoughts in your head and she always like convinced herself what because of like wanting to protect people and she like she held these toxic beliefs at the same time she was convincing herself that they were good yeah well, that's the illness of the mind. You can you can hold beliefs or thoughts that don't make sense to anyone else if your mind's not right. Yeah, and that, that's what you and your sister need to continue to remind yeah. yourself that your mom just wasn't right in her head. It wasn't her talking. It wasn't her saying those things. Maybe yeah. that'll help personalize it and not make it quite so hurtful. But yeah. allow yourself to grieve in the process you need and give yourself time. Reach out to yeah. these groups. Let us know how we can help. Call back in sometime. Let us know how you're doing. Okay, Wallace? All right. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Thank day. Thank you. Thank you, Wallace. Bye. You're just hurting. There's no way to sugarcoat that. Let's try to get to these calls. We've got them stacking up. I see Steve there. Hang in there, Steve. I want to get to first Rosie she, her in New York. Hey, Rosie, you're on the line with... Dave and Daryl. Hey guys. Hey Rosie. This is it's Rosie. cool to be on. <laughs> yeah. Um, What's on yeah, your mind? Uh, it's 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 more like just looking for general advice because um, I'm an atheist and I'm getting sober and a couple of weeks strong now and and every time I it comes up and I'm talking to someone they kind of go straight away to the twelve step program and those, you know, a lot of the ideas are really great, you know, um, making restitution to the people you've hurt and et cetera. But there's so much about giving yourself over to a higher power or, um, you know, entrusting your sobriety to someone, someone or something else. And I just don't vibe with that at all. I just don't, I just don't see how giving my choice to get sober into the hands of something else how i don't see how that's going to help me at all and um and i was just wondering if you if you guys are uh, dr ray if you have any kind of advice to you know how are there like secular groups or or just you know any way to find a community of, of sober atheists around because I just don't like the twelve step program at all. I've heard you. Well, Rosie, you have you way. go ahead. What what'd you say? I'm sorry. I said I've heard you talk about this at conferences. Take it away. Uh, Rosie, I have take I have given two major speeches in the last um uh, four four or five months on the whole notion that Reco Alcoholics Anonymous is just a religion. That's all it is. Yep. It is not it is not, and I'm gonna I'm gonna capitalize that it is not a treatment program. And people you know, argue. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's not a treatment program. It was it was it was designed in 1935, and they haven't really updated it since. There's a lot of science. We know a hell of a lot of shit now that we didn't know back then. Um, there's no treatment in it. It's, and eight of the twelve steps have some kind of higher power of God in them. So your your underlying discomfort is well placed. Your instincts are absolutely correct. So also, that's my first um, thing. Um, but also something that I've noticed when when the when it, we go we get into the back and forth about the twelve step programs, 
is that I always hear back, you know, about how often people relapse on the program. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, if, if so many people relapse so often, then the efficacy of the program is, you know, <laughs> moot. <laughs> You're so a scientist, bro. You're a really scientist. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, so the amp, there's a there's a good answer to your question. Yes, there are there's organizations, for example, um, life, um, gosh, a secular sobriety is one of them. There there are okay. three there are three different secular sobriety or, um, or organizations. All three of them have been tested empirically. Uh, their systems are not twelve steps. And that's important. They are not 12 step. They have very specific things they teach and, uh, and they also use a group format. It's not, and they're free. You don't have to pay anything for them, but go look that's up nice. secular, secular sobriety, uh, SOS. Uh, oh gosh, there's life. I can't life ring life ring. That's another okay. one. And the beautiful thing about those is these days, a lot of them are online and they're on Zoom call kind of stuff. And you better. can find you can find groups that will you get the information, you get the, the literature and they uh, most of them use a version or a component of cognitive behavioral therapy. Which, which is probably CBT, CBT is probably. Um, the best way, the best foundation. I'm not going to say it's the cure, but it's the best foundation to get you started. So I trust, uh, I trust their systems. I've seen their systems for years. Nothing works perfectly, but um, yeah. So that's the answer. And I know, oh, by the way, that my mentor, uh, my mentor was Albert Ellis, the founder and father of CBT. So I know the well, damn system very well. And I'm, I'm confident that what they've got works. Yeah, my sister. Um, my sister is a used to be a social worker. And now she works at an elementary school as a as a counselor, and um, she's she's taught me a few things about uh, CBT. So I've yeah. trying, been incorporating them into my last few weeks. Um, I've been doing this on my own, and the thing is, I don't really like people. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I I just don't you know the idea of you know sitting in group and airing my my woes is not really yeah. ideal for me. Um, that's that's not a so, treatment. Yeah, that is yeah. not a treatment. Yeah, it's treating one. But, but I do. Together, I do know that I can't do it completely alone, and I just you know I'm just grateful for the information. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, you know I think there is an element that you can't get away from. And that is an element of accountability because yes. we, uh, Rosie, we fool ourselves so, so easily. Uh, Very easily. <laughs> yeah. There's a, uh, there's also a, 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 an approach called harm reduction that um, is important. It, it's the problem with AA is they have a philosophy and an ideology that just does not match reality at all. And so yeah, what you want to do is find a system that works best for you. Yeah, it's, um, I, there's something, I don't know. I feel like there's something so nefarious about the 12 step program because it kind of, like I said, um, in the beginning of the, of the call, giving away the choice to get sober just feels like, I don't know, like it takes that, you know, giving yeah. that to something else. It just, it just well, doesn't seem right. It it's like a learned help. Dependence for another. Your your dependence on alcohol or drugs is being swapped for a dependence on this group, and you've got to get to this group every night. And right. you're still dependent. And, and what else in this world has not been altered since 1935? My God. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, the whole would, notion it, it, it's um, it's called learned learned helplessness. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that term. I am. So what AA does is it teaches you a form of learned helplessness. You yeah. are helpless. It even <laughs> says it right in the damn step, 12 steps. You are helpless. Well, yeah, I'm looking know, at you're, not right helpless. you're not helpless. You are empowered. And that's what we're trying to do is teach you 
how to empower yourself to take responsibility for your own choices and then move forward. Yeah, I'm finding that um I'm finding that the more I own up to my sobriety, the more um I'm getting help from the people around me. Good. And Good. that feels very really nice, you know. It feels nice to know that that my misandry <laughs> is not stopping people from, you know, just recognizing that making the choice to get sober is a very powerful choice in the really? process of getting sober. So, and, so yeah. and it's the opposite, opposite of AA. What you're doing is the yeah. opposite and it's empowering. You're taking control of your life and yeah, uh, proud of you for doing that. I know that's hard. And uh, it's not an easy thing, but you you're on the right track. And what Daryl says is so good. If you if you need help getting in touch with any of those uh, secular groups, secular sobriety, just you know reach out to one of us, and and we can make sure you get connected. But you're you're uh you're doing the hard work, and it's you doing it. It's not a dependence on a higher power. It's right. you, Rosie. It's me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it just yeah, it just seems so counterintuitive the twelve steps. And yeah. I just want to say, Dave, like, I'm a huge fan of yours. So like hearing that from you is like very nice. It's just very cool. Oh, thank you. I, I mean it. I, I just for you to take control of your life and not let someone else write your story, um, whether it's a bottle or a, a drug or a, a, a program, it's you that's in charge of your life. It's you that writes your story. And you get to write it the way you want to write it. And and Daryl's right. When when we have issues that are out of our control, we need help sometimes. And having people walk with you in this is helpful. But they're not doing it. You're doing it. And there's not a program that's doing it. It is not a fucking higher power. It's Rosie. Yeah, it's us. It's just us. Yeah. Yep. Good to you. Thanks for calling in. Thank you for bringing this up. It's a pet peeve of mine. AA yeah. is a real big pet peeve of mine. It really pisses me off. On these talks, he drops f bombs. He gets crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fucking awesome. Yeah, he is fucking awesome. So are you, Rosie? You're fucking awesome. Thank you for coming. So are you, Dave? All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Good for her. I'm glad we had that call because I know you I, talked about. It many I times. do, and yeah, it really irritates me that we. Out of people think there's I, no other choice. They think that's the best option yeah, there is. Right. Um, American Atheist. And um, then I want to remind you, we, we do read the super chats after this on, on air. Daryl and I will read them. If you mention FSM, he'll read it specially because he's the high priest of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, self-appointed for life. And um, any any super chat over $5. We'll read on the air. So get those chats in. <laughs> okay, I'm not self-appointed. I You just don't understand. I am personally appointed by the FSM. Oh, you, you had a dream. Okay, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Steve, he, him in Canada. Hey, Steve, you're on the line with Dave and Daryl. Dave and Daryl, my two favorite people. Hey, Dave. Hey, Oh, man, we I know it's a long way to get a lot of calls tonight. Good to hear from you. Oh, yeah. Um, so smart recovery is the other one you're thinking of, uh, Dr. Ray. Thank you. You're right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah good. smart recovery. Yeah, so we do have a, a big database of, uh, of resources like that. So um, I guess if uh, I'm not sure. I heard a beep, so I didn't hear uh, the introduction. But uh, I am a volunteer for Recovering from Religion with Dr. Daryl Ray. And uh, my job there is the ambassador program director. Um, so events that you see an RFR representative, most likely they've come through my training program. And the reason why we created this program uh, a few years ago is because uh, we were thinking about the ethics of cloning uh, Daryl and Gail. <laughs> and it didn't really, we didn't know if that would be ethical or not. So we started training some other volunteers to be able to go and uh, represent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, that's but, uh, a new Dave, one. I got, <laughs> <laughs> and Dave, I got to see you uh, recently at BajaCon, which was uh, yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and 
I got a funny story. Um, so Matt Dillahunty wasn't able to be there, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we were all passing around a book that we were signing, and it was uh, one of Greta Vosper's books. And everyone mm-hmm. was signing a little message to, to Matt. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's bugs everywhere. I just choked on one. Um, and uh, so it was me and Drew Beckius, and we're standing there, and we signed the book. And we pass it on to Dave. And Dave looks at us, and he goes, oh, I'm sorry, I, I can't sign this. And Drew and I look at each other, and we're like, oh, no. Like, our, our looks at to each other were just, like, really sad. We're like, oh, no, Dave's got to the point now in his ALS where he can't sign. And he goes, because he's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so I we burst out laughing, and then he signs the book. I got you for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's a lovable asshole, just like I am. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> Yeah. I saw yeah. you around. You were having all kinds of people sign it. That was awesome. Yeah. You missed me. Oh you yeah, it was, um, it was amazing. That was an uh, of, amazing uh, turnout for for that yeah, in yeah. Uh, in Canada here. So that was really cool. And I get to see you again at the uh, RFR Fall Excursion coming up, right? Yeah. Just in a few weeks. Yep. Right. Awesome. And and Bevin's coming as well. Oh yeah. Yep. She, she's awesome. we, we're a tag team. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So, you know, yeah, my, you my got... heart goes out to all the. I'm sorry. We all started talking at once. I don't know. If you I was just going to say, I was glad. I'm yeah. glad you uh, got to meet Drew Beckius. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We uh, I, I hung out with him last year too. And uh, there's a funny oh. story about Drew, and I'm not sure if I should say it on on the air here, but uh, <laughs> uh, a few of us went out uh, went up to a private room after. Uh, the con- convention and uh, had some some pops and some chats and and things like that and then uh, someone found it very hard to make it down in the morning. So. <laughs> <laughs> we may have had to send a search party. Oh, okay. Long, so. Search party. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. but yeah, um, that- no, my okay. heart goes out to all the people that that called uh, on the line already. Um, and and I, Wallace, if you're still listening. You know, when someone says they're they're trying to take away your 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 grief, they don't actually mean they're taking away your grief or they want to. They're they're talking about taking away those that pain that you have, and it's because as humans we all have these mirror neurons that we feel the pain that someone else is feeling, and that's empathy and compassion. And we don't need a book to tell us that that's what we are feeling. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's a good word. Um, I don't know if you heard the first part of the program, but uh, our first caller. Um, Robin from Kentucky is part of your ambassador program, and she did a, yes. a booth at the county fair last last week. And so we were getting a report on that. I love, love, love that concept of getting out and doing grassroots uh, marketing, if you will, um, for RFR and I'm Dying Out Loud and, and reaching out to people where, where they live. So um, I think that's a great concept. Yeah, it's been amazing. And, and no, I didn't hear that first part there, but uh, but Robin, I've been in, in direct contact with her quite often yeah. since she started the program. And uh, yeah, she she's a big fan of yours. She had your your books there, and she was representing you as well. So that was amazing. Yeah, good job. I told her I think she's the first person to do a county fair. Am I correct? Yeah, the first one, in, to my knowledge, yes, yes. Me sure. too. I don't think I've ever heard of anybody doing one. I mean, I've thought about it myself we got a county fair here um but i've never done it i've never tried to do it <laughs> i have gone there and, yeah. and t- uh, I talked with the evangelical ministers that had booths there <laughs> and i gave i gave <laughs> well, them my card <laughs> that's great well, <laughs> that's awesome well thanks for what you yeah, do in the yeah. program steve it's good good work you guys are doing such good oh. work well, thank you very much for what you do, too. I mean, we're all part of a huge community that's there for everyone. You know, we, we feel that in our heart that we need to be there for people. And uh, it's something that we, we want to do. And we're damn good at it. Yep. <laughs> I don't know if you saw so, And I did. Oh, I'm sorry. But we, we got an a incredibly nice um, note today from somebody who's benefited from our, our work. I should pass it along to you. I, I'll if you haven't seen it yet. No, I haven't. That's that's awesome. That's yeah, amazing. I'll I'll send it to you. Okay, great. Yeah, thank, thank you, you uh, thank you, Dave, for 
for having uh, Daryl on. Yeah, always glad to have Daryl on. We'll have him on again. Yeah, that's awesome. And I did buy your book on Amazon because every time I see you, you're sold out. <laughs> so I'll bring it to the uh, I'll bring it to the full excursion. And if you can't sign it because you're ALS, that's one thing. But if it's because of an asshole, I guess I'm gonna have to change. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, I'll happily sign it. I was just kidding about. I, it is as you can see. <laughs> my signature from Matt was was very non undistinguishable, and he'll know which one was mine because everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want to no, say it's really nice. Uh... Steve is doing an amazing job. Uh, since ever since he took over the uh, ambassador program, we're getting we're our outreach has increased by orders of magnitude. So, thanks, Steve, for for what you're doing, and I can't wait to meet you. We've never met face to face. Oh, have you not? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. A few yeah. weeks away. Yep, I'll be, I'll be driving be down from Canada. So, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Well, thanks for calling, Steve. Good to hear from you. Okay. Good night. Yeah. Thanks so much. Take care. We didn't get to your call tonight. I apologize. We just run out of time. I just, I can't go as long as some of the other hosts. I get really tired, but please call back next week. We'll, we'll take your call. Um, if you call back in and you, if we didn't get you tonight, call back and um, we will uh, put you at the head of the queue next time. So we just had a lot of calls tonight and some good calls. You wouldn't really need to spend time with. And so if you've got uh Time, Daryl. We'll do a few super chats before we go. Yeah, let's let's do it. Okay, you take the first one. Marie Ware sent a fifty dollars super chat. Well, sticker. All right. Thank you for a super sticker. Thank you, Marie. Thank Appreciate you, Marie. You Ten dollars from Alan Ferguson. Glad to see you looking well, Dave. Thank you both. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate that. Thanks, I Alan. I was a sickie last week, but thank you for your support and for your message. This is in honor of Robin. May her courage inspire us all. I agree. Thank you, Greg. Greg Markowski. Thank you, Greg's Greg. Our, uh, Greg's a board member of our nonprofit, Daryl. I, uh, I know Greg. Uh, yeah, I met him at a couple of different tabling events recently. Right. You, you met him in St. Louis. He's, a, he's another yeah. Kansas City friend. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. He's a huge supporter. Ten dollars from the Raven Two Hundred. Us atheists are just like everyone else. We drive cars and go to the theater. We just don't believe in gods, and just so happen to eat babies. Oh yeah, there's that. Oh, <laughs> oh wait, Jimmy, go take a future shock DDT on concrete. <laughs> Daryl, what you don't know is Raven um, each week. She creates different ways to insult Jimmy. Oh, um, oh right. And on the show, instead of telling Jimmy we love him, we yeah. say go fuck yourself. Okay, so you know the you know the rest. I know, I know. I I just have never said it but, directly to his face, go fuck yourself, Jimmy. But I'll learn. I'll learn. Yeah. You'll learn. But Raven comes up with creative ways to say go fuck yourself. <laughs> okay. Good for Raven. Thank you, Raven. Uh, Ten dollars from Wall Thomas Walker. It's been a long time since you got a six 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 from Jimmy. Uh, so I will send one of on her behalf. Thank you, Dave and Daryl. What is a uh, six point six six? I met Thomas. Thank you, brother. I, I love you, man. Um, Thomas lost his wife last year unexpectedly, oh. and um, she was a big supporter of our uh, GD show, and every oh, week. Right. So she would send in a 666 Super Chat sticker. And we called it our Antichrist sticker. And uh, so, yeah, Thomas, we miss those. We miss those stickers from Kim. And I know you still miss her. I'm really sorry, buddy. Hang in there. Yep. 999 again from Greg Markowski. Daryl, you looking forward to the Chiefs kicking off this Thursday? How do you think they'll do without CJ? I think we're going to kick the Lions ass and we're going to go back to the Super Bowl. That's what I think. I think I think CJ needs to get his um, brain in the right spot. Money isn't everything. How, many, how often do you get to go to a Super Bowl? 
Uh, yeah, he's only getting what thirty million. He wants thirty five million or something. I don't know. Yeah, he's got. He needs to get his head out of his ass. Um, I've, uh, I've been. I've been with Daryl Ray in person watching a Chiefs game. <laughs> it ain't pretty, folks. It ain't pretty. <laughs> <laughs> this man is a serious Chiefs fan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Ten dollars from Dylan Schuler. My roommate's cat passed away. I was the one to find him. It made me think more on how I've always had odd reaction to death. I almost couldn't cry while I comforted her and couldn't process it correctly. Well, thank you for that. Dylan, for your message and your super chat. Man, that's tough. Death, whether it's a, a friend, a, a family member, a pet, it's just so final and it just is hard. And when we pretend it's not, then we, like Daryl said earlier about how easily we fool ourselves, that's one of the ways we fool ourselves and it's not helpful. And the only way to deal with death is to just go through it and do the best you can to comfort your loved ones, allow them to comfort you and process it the best you can. So be kind to yourself and don't worry about how you should do it or did do it. Just do the best you can. There isn't a, there isn't a correct way to process, but you were there for your friend. That's the most exactly. important thing. Thank you for that, Dylan. $10 from Atlas Die. I went to a church counselor in the middle of my eating disorder, LDS. Oh, LDS. He said the only other girls he worked with were now dead. <laughs> Whoa. Bad stat. Uh, didn't go back. Well, Atlas, I think you uh, your instincts were very correct there. Do not go to that. That's crazy. Oh, Atlas, I'm sorry you dealt with that. Thank you for your support again. We love you. Um, and, uh, yeah, good instincts on not going back to that quack. And LDS, they they educate people in masters and PhDs at Brigham Young University, and they come out really, really poorly trained. So be yeah. careful if you're on going to a th therapist that's LDS trained. They yeah. may have all the degrees and they may be able to spout about the terminology, but they still haven't gotten rid of their crazy magical thinking. Five alleged Canadian dollars from JL. Sounds like he just did what he could. Equals definition of a good son without a mother to tell him otherwise. Yeah, that's the call about his mom dying. That's exactly right, JL. Yeah. For that message, I think that's exactly the point we were trying to make is yeah. that's what he could do in that situation. Well said, JL. $10 from Cy. Okay, sending love and hugs to all the callers and, of course, the lovely hosts. Thank you, Sai. Si. Appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, we had some tough calls today. Yeah, important ones. Important topics we deal with here. $5 from Trudy. Why does Gilmore's guitar make me cry? Dead is dead, but the spirit in me sings. David Gilmore, Pink Floyd. I agree. His guitar is just, uh, I love the song they do called uh, uh, Great Gig in the Sky, um, where they deal, where they talk about not being afraid of dying. And then it's just a female vocalist just uh, riffs for like 10 minutes. It's absolutely stunning. But thank you for that, Trudy. I agree with you. This you? Is, your, is yours or mine? Oh, Five dollars from Monkey at Typewriter. The punchline of the story about calling Matt an asshole. I laughed out loud in the grocery store, and now the dairy aisle thinks I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of, I kind of got Steve on that when I said I can't sign that, and he thought, "Oh no, I asked him to sign. His ALS is acting up." So I, I. <laughs> I enjoyed act. I enjoyed doing that, Tim. That was funny. <laughs> Thank you, That's monkey. Great. Ten dollars from Dylan Fuller. I know folks say everyone processes grief differently, but for me, death hasn't felt real, even when I've been with those as they passed. 
It's almost like an ob my object permanence blocks it from me in a way. Yeah. I, I you know, Dylan, I think that's not an uncommon reaction. And, and many people just learn how to fake it till you make it kind of, only they may never make it. So don't worry, you are doing the best you can with that person at that time. And the fact that you're there with them, that's that's what counts, not whether you exactly appropriately right. respond. Yeah. And as Daryl said earlier, there's no correct way to deal with this. It's just everyone processes it differently and everyone does it. And you, like he said, you don't know how many people are faking it, looking looking like they're handling it, and they're really not. Yeah, so, how many ministers put on a great act as they're sitting in the hospital room with someone dying? And yeah. it's an act because they don't even know who the person is. They, you know, the family brought them in. I, I'll, I'll say this, Dylan. I watched both of my parents die. I was actually in the room when my father, um, and almost in the room when my mother died, and I had a similar feeling. I. I disassociated, but that's not it's abnormal. Not, not abnormal because we don't know what death is. We've not experienced it. Right. We can see it. We can be told what it is, but we don't. None of us have ever personally experienced de death. We right. just have to admit that. So let's quit acting like we know what it's like. If we don't. Right. Aviatrix23 sent a $5 super chat sticker. Thank you for that. $5 from unapologetically Chrissy. Thank you all for everything you do. Thank you, uh, Chrissy. We appreciate that. We appreciate your support and saying that. We do it because we love it. And uh, yeah, we feel like it makes a difference. Uh, so there's that. Thank you, everybody, for your super chats. Thank you for your calls. Thank you uh, for the uh, call screeners and the support room for Arden, our great producer tonight. Jimmy, get better. Uh, Daryl, everyone knows where to find you, but tell us again what you're doing, where to find you, what you're up to. Sure. Go find us at recoverfromreligion.org. Chat in if you need to talk to someone. Join one of our groups. Meet up. Um, also, if you need a therapist, go to sectortherapy.org, and uh, you can you can find well vetted, uh, secular, empirically um, motivated, empirically trained therapists. So that's it. Oh, and if you read, uh, read my YouTube. books, The Sector oh, yeah. God and uh, The God Virus. I, in which fact, is the better the book? Stuff, the God Pardon? Virus, Sex and God. Which is the better book? Uh, well, Sex and God is better than the God virus, which is better than Sex and God. <laughs> I knew you'd say something like that. <laughs> ah, you're a mess. Um, also, I'm going to be on RFRX Monday night, uh, the Zoom call thing. Yeah, uh, right. So you usually pop into that, don't you? I'm there almost every week, unless I'm in Iceland. <laughs> in Iceland, right. So I missed two weeks because of that. Whoever's on that on that call, I'll see you there Monday night, and then I'll okay. see you doing the excursion in a few weeks in the hills of Tennessee. Right, and that'll be nice. Um, but everyone else, thanks again for tuning in to Dying Out Loud on the line. Um, you know the show's coming up the rest of the week. I didn't announce them because I wasn't sure who was on what. I know that Matt's going to be on the hang up tomorrow night. I know Arden, I think, and Katie are on the call in uh, the Transatlantic Call in show on Thursday and then uh, the Sunday show as always is a huge show. So thank you everyone for tuning in to the line. We appreciate your support. Again, if you want to support us more, patreon.com slash call the line. It means a lot. It helps us do this kind of stuff. And as you can see, it helps folks. So thank you everyone. And we close out as always with the running with Thank you all of you for doing it.